Man, what's happening, man? You got Marshawn, Beast Mode, Lynch, Doug Hendrickson, and Gavin Newsom, and you're listening to Politicking. You're on the beat. You're on the beat. Gavin, it's interesting. I was on the heels of the debate on Tuesday. I know you were there. I know Marshawn was somewhere. I just got back from uh, a little trip here. What was the vibe like there, being there? He got crushed. I mean, Trump got crushed, he knew, he, he, and he knew it. I mean, I was in the spin room, and all of a sudden, there's all this commotion. I'm, I'm doing a live hit on NBC or MSNBC, one of the, one of the two, and uh, everybody looks over our shoulder, and there's this giant scrum because Trump came down to his own spin room. And I'll tell you what, I mean, there's no greater tell than that. Uh, when you are the principal, you're in the debate, you've got all these folks that are supposed to be doing that for you. He clearly was trying to shape shift the fact that he got crushed. And of course, he came in, as only Trump said, he said it was the best debate he ever had. He was here in California, trashing California at his golf course right on the coast, uh, the Pacific Ocean behind him. More Couldn't be more beautiful, saying it's the worst state in the world. Uh, trashing everything about California and uh, said he, he won the debate overwhelmingly. The polls represent that. Uh, he got crushed. It was an embarrassment. He looked weak. Oh, Gavin, explain it to me. So when you say the spin room, so he walks, he leaves the stage and the spin room is what? How many people are in there? Who's spin in room's there? In a, it's in another room. So you got the convention, which is just down the road. He made all his way all the way up to the convention room. And you just imagine hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reporters and all doing live shots from the, all the spectrum, Fox News, not just, you know, ABC News and, and, and CNN. Uh, everybody's there. You, you got the who's who of the Republican Party. Uh, you got RFK Jr. there. You got Tulsi Gabbard there, Vivek Ramaswamy. You got Doug Bergman, uh, all his surrogates. You got all of us uh, on the other side. Horn. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, and it, everybody's spinning. Of course, for us, it was a cakewalk. I mean, we walked in there, big smiles on our face. These guys had a hard time spinning the fact that it was a good debate for uh, for, for Trump. It was terrible. I mean, you look, it, I'm, you can't look at it objectively and not, and not uh, make that conclusion. Did you, did that you said, and Trump have any words? No, I didn't. <laughs> I would look forward to seeing him. I, I, I want to have some words with him today after he's trash in California. Bro, you should have went and grabbed them gloves that I was using out there in Cuba to uh, fight them kids. Tackling those kids. By the way, them. let's talk about that. Where the hell was the ref? You were tackling the kids. Yeah, see, in the I, had to, I, had, I had to play to my advantage. <laughs> yeah, 200 pounds, man, 200 pounds. Man, them them little kids were shifty, man. But you should have you should have grabbed some of them gloves and seen if uh, Batman can throw them hands. Well, I'll tell you that the, the gloves that were thrown were Harris threw the gloves. She threw the gloves. And by the way, if it was a prize fight, Marshawn, it was a TKO in the second round. She took him down, commanded the stage from the first second when she walked right up to him and introduced herself as Kamala Harris. She she put it out there how to pronounce her. her, uh, her yeah, he's still the, the disrespect that 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 ex-president has is next level, man. But Gavin, after all this shit he talks about you, do you ever feel like when you saw him in the spin room to walk up to him and just say, hey, bro, you got fucking crushed and and look him in the eye and walk out? Or do you? No, nah, Gavin, bro, we from California. We don't do no talking. So if you're going to walk up, you got a fire on blood. I ain't going to even hold you. So <laughs> if you ain't going to do that, then you might as well just don't don't turn into one of these Internet gangsters. If you see him, it's on sight. Damn, you just got to get off hella quick. Like, damn. That's what I'm saying. You got to hit him with a club punch, too. I don't know if you it's probably no, been a long time since you've been in a club, but you get in a club, you off a couple of them shots of Patrinacy, you get the little wobble like this, and then you come overhand like this. Bang! Right on that chin. See if he could take that. Oh, God. You know, I was looking at the verbal hits, not the no, no, physical no, no. hits, but I appreciate. And by the way, when the Secret Service visits you. I just want to make sure that we recognize that was Marshawn Lynch talking about the physical. Tell them they better make sure I ain't got a little bit of oil in me because I got a club punch for their ass too. <laughs> but ha have you ever been in a have you ever been in a uh a, 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 a real fight before again? Look you see the scar right there, brother? Right there sliding into home plate. No 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 I'm talking about I'm talking about a we hand got into hand. it got into it that's a cleat right there brother that's a cleat right there stitches so you're saying you didn't do too well we talk it? about guns not just the ones in oklahoma <laughs> let's talk about the guns 
<laughs> but I don't I don't take my weapons out. I use my verbal weapons. I'm a peacemaker now. Uh, peacemaker. Oh, so now. So you did yeah. throw hands before. Well, back in the day. It was, you like know, even like different. even when, when you was a youth. <laughs> when you was a youngster. I was good. I, I, I was good. I was the one getting bullied, man. But we'll talk about that another day. But no, I. I, I I grew into my own. Now no one messes. Well, not many people mess. Hell with. yeah, you got a motherfucking title that a lot of motherfuckers are scared of. I wouldn't try to, you know what I mean? <laughs> but see, though, y'all on that level together where y'all could actually, you know what I mean? Because I see all the YouTubers doing it. I mean, uh, the athletes going into it. I mean, you know, go ahead and show the uh, the political world that, you know what I mean, y'all ain't scared to get in the ring and throw a couple hands. Well, no, here's the deal, Marshawn. Gavin and I both had bullies. I, I'll, I'll tell you my story. You, Gavin can tell his. I'll never forget this. I'm in seventh grade, Marshawn, and I got this big guy. He's an eighth grader. Every day is waiting for me at the top of the steps. And he, I, I, would, go, I, I would go around the long way to school because I was terrified of this guy. He got me one time, pushed me down, and I was terrified of this guy. So you never ate lunch in eighth grade? No, I was in seventh grade. But, oh, but then my dad, grade. my dad heard about it, and he said, "Listen, the only way you're going to be able, this guy's going to stop bullying you, is you got to stand up to him." So he mm -hmm. literally bought me some boxing gloves, took me in the backyard, taught me how to box and throw. So finally, after about three weeks, I walk up the steps, and the big dude's waiting for me. And I sat there, and the guy said words, all the buddies around him, and I got the first punch and whack. Hit the dude right in the nose. <laughs> and didn't do shit. Didn't do anything, but he beat me up. But guess what? That was the last time that ever happened to me by this guy. And then we became friends. Did he hang you upside down by your ankles? And, he didn't and, hang and, me upside and, down like I did John Schneider in your contract. I still have that picture of that, Marshall. Oh, God. Oh, Having my said God. that, Christ. that was my bully. I know, Gavin, you had a few bully stories. Yeah, we, yeah we, we call him the bully of Baltimore because it was Baltimore Avenue in Corte Madera. And my story doesn't end well, but I will say that boxing thing resonated because this is around Rocky when Rocky came out and I was doing raw eggs every single morning. It got my my gloves from Big Five down the block Ooh, and was hitting okay. all the time. And I was ready okay. to go and I wimped out, wimped oh. out. He used to surround me at a paper route and I'd come in on the paper route. I used to try to climb in the back and it was always hard, but I had my bike, I couldn't climb over. And so anytime he'd come down, they'd surround me, push me over. My sister would start crying. Uh, and I will say this, see, it was my mom, not my dad in this case. She went down with me one night and they lived just down the block and walked right in. <laughs> and I thought, I thought she was going to take care of it. She made me walk up there with her. I'm, I'm nervous as hell right behind her. And they got into it. My mom is like, she was young and they got into it. And the dad and the mom were defending the bully. And my mom got in it. She turned around and brought us back to the house. About six months later, we moved out of the neighborhood. So it didn't end as well. You got no ran punch. up out the spot. You we can't got get ran, ran up out, out the spot. spot. She had had oh, enough. Oh, no, man. You know what's That's crazy. That's the bully of Baltimore, man. If he's, if he's listening, it ain't over yet. <laughs> but, Marshawn, you know what's crazy about that uh, the incident I had? And, Gavin, you might feel the same way as a father. You know, like, that scarred me literally for a long time. And so when I, whenever I hear the kids come back about, you know, a kid at school getting picked on by somebody or whatever, I always go to them. I say, listen, man, here's my story. Go befriend that kid. Go find that 100%. kid and make it right. Because that's the one thing that the, one of the only things that pisses me off as a parent when I hear stories of kids eating alone or getting bullied or whatever it may be. You know, have someone to go pick them up um, and and defend them, whatever it may be. And so I, I'm a big believer in that because I went through. I'm, I'm sure the same thing with you guys. Yeah, with your kids. Trust me, man. A hundred percent. I like. There's nothing I hate more than bullies, and I, and I I, I completely absolutely convinced the exact same thing happened to you. It was that early experience. And by the way, it was also around that same time that one of my seventh grade uh, classmates, seventh grade classmates called me new scum instead mm. of new sum. And you know, who I, I listened today, Donald Trump, he called me new scum about 10 times during a press conference. All I can think is this is a guy who wants to be president of the United States again, calling me the same damn nickname that a kid in seventh grade. He calls uh, you that today? Called. Yeah, new scum, new scum. <laughs> I mean, talk about a man child. I could guess we could say that nickname kind of stuck with you. Some some people get names like uh like Beast Mode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some get I got new scum. Some get new scum. So you know, it's kind of like you know, what I mean, some things just stick. You know what hey, I mean? Gavin, like, this guy's oh, obsessed with you, bro. It's crazy. He, he's it's pathetic. Weakness. Calling you out ten strength. times today. Weakness. 
Bullies are the weakest people in the world. They're weak. They put on a mask. They're weak. They're broken. They're insecure. That's all that is. That's why you hit him in the face. The dude ran away. I mean, it's a cliche. It's classic. But you know what? A lot of folks don't have that courage to hit him back in the face. And they and that's why we got to stand up for him. I, I think you just know that it's value in, in bringing you up. So by him bringing you up, then I guess he think, you know, I mean, he got the he gonna get the ear of some people by bringing up Gavin. Yeah, no, I'm gonna. I'm that's a the va- that's the that's the value in you, Batman. I appreciate. It. No, I'm I'm here for everybody. I told you, I work for everybody. Start getting a little worried if he start calling you Batman, because then you know he really, oh. he really, he really, he really honing in on you, and he's trying to figure out. some shit out. <laughs> yeah, you gotta watch that one. Uh, so, Gavin, were you surprised he didn't want to debate for the third time? No. He's scared to death. I mean, of course he doesn't want to debate. He just well, he, he thought he won. He thought he won. No, he didn't think he won. He knew better. That's why he showed up at the spin room. He's a con man. He's a fraudster. I mean, so he, he I mean, obviously he's spinning the spinners. I mean, it, it, it's a, it was an embarrassment and he knows it and he doesn't want to be embarrassed again. So he, he copped out. He ran. He ran away. You know, I mean, talk about, I mean, she punched him in the face. And he ran away. I mean, it's a perfect metaphor for what we just discussed. And uh, and the problem is the poll numbers don't reflect much of a move. And that goes back to your point in Oklahoma. We're living in two different worlds in the same state, nation. Uh, I mean, it's 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 going to be a grind, man. It's like World War One. You're just in the trenches, inch by inch by inch, back and forth. And so nothing about this stuff's going to be easy, but it just it's a reflective of the, of the moment we're living in. Well, it's funny. I read um, I read the Pat Mahomes thing where he didn't want to uh, endorse anybody, which I totally dig. But he was he was his his reason why was great. I sent it to Gavin. He's like, look, you know, I want, you know, people can like whoever they want, but live in humanity, uh, you know, live together, peaceful, the whole thing. So he said it in the right way. I can't remember exactly what he just said, yeah. but it was a pretty cool comment. He's like, look, I'm not going to get involved in this. That's not my job. But you know, there was a day when everyone did get along and and, and they weren't uh, fighting and killing over you know, who's going to be the president. Amen. And, uh, you know, I will say the biggest thing that did happen that night uh, was Taylor Swift's endorsement of, uh, of Harris for no other reason than this. Just getting folks that may not vote, young folks to vote, get them registered and get them vote to vote. And that could be an entire race that could be determinative in this race. Don't ever underestimate her influence and power. Uh, and uh, and as I gave advice to Trump, uh, he should be very careful of how he reacts to that endorsement. Gavin, have you seen it? Have you seen an influx of, of the, the younger people from uh, the last three elections, more votes of the 18 to 22 year old crowd since uh, 08 and when Obama started to now? No, I mean, uh, well, I mean, it's going to be a good segue to, to Will I Am, who was so instrumental as a cultural icon during that 2008 uh, election with Obama. But no, it's, I mean, you've seen a regression in that respect. There's a lot of cynicism with young folks in the last few years uh, about politics and politicians. And so they're walking away. That's why it's a big deal that uh, not only uh, she dialed in uh, for Harris, but she's dialing up the registration and the energy uh, for the Harris campaign. So, no, I mean, it's the young folks that that ultimately will sway this election or like will determine the fate and future of this election. And the issues they care about, the issues Harris cares about, the climate issues of gun policy, gun safety uh, issues, obviously, around democracy and choice, and freedom, all those good things. Right, Marshawn? Hey, by the way, Marshawn, what the hell is going on? There's there, apparently we have an epidemic of people eating cats and dogs. Have you been reading about this stuff, brother? I did, man. I just seen they uh they dropped uh, they dropped your boy DT uh his mixtape talking about eating cats and dogs, man. They <laughs> oh, bro, they doing some shit. I don't know what that is. I don't know, man. It it's a it's a it's a fucked up time right now. <laughs> I wonder how they doing. Is they doing shish kebabs or is they oh, putting them on a barbecue grill? Yeah, you know I mean fried or. Uh, you know I, mean? I don't know how they doing that, but you, I mean, shit. Leave it, leave it, leave it up to people. They gonna fucking uh, put some salt and pepper on anything and try it. God damn, <laughs> that's assuming it happened. It's BS. Shit. It's BS. We have our guest starting uh, ready to jump in right now. Let's do it. Bring Will in.
What's up? What's up? Will, hey, how Will. you doing, my man? What's up with it? Hey, Gavin. How you doing, brother? Thanks chilling, for being chilling, with us, chilling. man. What's up, yo, daddy? What up, bro? Yeah, what's happening, man? You done chilling, bounced chilling. on this motherfucker cooler than the fam, my boy. <laughs> Damn. You know what I'm saying? Look, I'm glad I came with a little style because shit, man. You know what I mean? I got to, you know what I mean? We got to represent for the You Feel Me's one time. God damn. <laughs> hey, What's what, happening what? with your big dog? Uh, just chilling here, bro. Just got back from South Korea. South yeah, Korea. What? That's what, one what? of them ones. That <laughs> was one of them ones. That's one of them ones on God. I had the pleasure, uh, and, and Will knows this back in, in the late 90s, meeting him with my client, the Dirty Bird, Jamal Anderson and Jay. Uh, Will back in the day, my younger years as an agent, but um, we're, we're so excited to have one of the legendary rappers, singers, songwriter, producers, entrepreneurs, Emmy winner with over a hundred million albums sold worldwide, you. an absolute <laughs> I icon in this world. Will I am welcome to Paula Chicken, bro. Hey. Oh man, it's, it's great to be, great to be here. You know, I like to, I'm a I'm a competitor. I like to oh, compete. Shit. And you know, I, 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 yo, real talk. If I didn't get that concussion, I would be like one of the best football players. But but I got the concussion. Oh on. man! Oh shit! <laughs> concussion, concussion. Yeah, I got I got hit hard. What position? <laughs> what position was you playing? I was a tailback. I'm I, I'm fast as hell though. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I'm fast, bro. Like oh, so you oh, so you was toting that rock then? For real, like I, Jamal Anderson. I mean, he ain't fast, but. I whooped him in a race. Oh uh, shit! Reggie Bush, he never want to race me because he know I'll smoke him. Okay. Still to this day, I'm fast. And Reggie bro. got and Reggie got gas though. No, Re Reggie ain't faster than me. Hey Reggie, right now on God, bro, you know you never wanted to race me because you know I'll skunk you, bro. Like you know that. <laughs> hey, well hold on, if you because Reggie four three, that ain't somebody you know. You just could just be saying I'm gonna run off on. So you you must got some uh. Some high octane in, the, in them things. You must got some ponies you over there running on, my boy. Yeah, you, you, I, I'm 4'2". Damn. Okay, now <laughs> we're talking cheetah talk. Coincidentally. We talking. <laughs> so, Will, Will, hey, who, yeah. was your, who was the backs you grew up liking then back in the day? Who were the running backs uh, you liked? So, my uncle played football for the, for the, for the, Falcons. For the Falcons. He was number yeah, 21. Was say, okay. So, it's in the blood. Yeah, then he played for the Rams. Um, yup. So, yup. And then I, I, I thought I was going to follow in his footsteps. Till I got cracked, <laughs> and yep, that's not that 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 was that was the end of my career. So you were I, just I, fast, yeah. That, but sometimes you ain't that fast to like if you get in the pitch <laughs> and you turn to the left and bam, like you, the speed don't do everything. So yeah, will growing right. up, growing up in L.A., where were you playing back in the day as a youngster? What year did you get the concussion? Oh, I got the concussion like straight straight seventeen. Okay, and that's when I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna do this music stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did this happen in a game or did this happen in practice? No, this happened in in a game and to the point where it messed up how I how I played afterwards cuz I was always I didn't like the feeling of I didn't know how I got there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that panic like how did I get here? Like where am I at? Like I didn't like that feeling. Yeah, you got that did that. So, hold on, hold on. Did you did you get a little nauseated too? I got nauseated. I got oh, okay. Yelled. Oh, then you had one of them ones. Yeah. Oh yeah, I lived for that shit. How many? Wait, or Sean, how wait. many times that happened to you? In cussed? Yeah. Like uh, one of them know, ones, I, as you say, the ones. Oh, I mean, I, I done been hit like that for sure. But as far as uh, concussions, I never been diagnosed with a uh, with a concussion before. No, do you remember like not remembering? Oh yeah, hell yeah. See, that's a good question. I mean, that, 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 thank you, thank you, doctor. Look, hold on, hold on. To my doctor defense, Will. I said I've never been diagnosed. Oh, got it, got uh, it. So, you know what I mean? I'm not saying I ain't done had them because I know as much as I be hitting motherfuckers with my head, I know some. I know some going on in that thing. We like to call it screws loose, but uh, mm -mm. yeah, I've never been diagnosed. But I that feeling when you get hit and you get nauseated in your stomach, like, oh shit, this ain't this ain't right. But I just go throw up and then get right back in there and try to see what's up. Now, now, if I don't remember, I'll go ask one of my teammates, hey, which one of the motherfuckers hit me? <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's who did it. All right. That, then I got to go see him about something. He got to come meet me in the office. But I'll tell you this. I just asked you if it was in a game or in practice because they say uh, we used to have this drill called the Oklahoma drill. 
and that's the head up drill, running back and the linebacker. And they said that drill alone made more NBA superstars than anything. Because if you can if you can get through the Oklahoma hidden drills, then you know what? You probably can you probably can make it in this uh in this football thing. Yeah, I couldn't have done that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't. Exactly. It worked out for everybody. Yeah, yeah. like like just to, just I mean, I love football. And I love to compete. I like I'm the talk shit kind of competitor. <laughs> I like that because you because you can get in a skin and you can fuck the whole game up. Hell yeah. Because I'm like you know, that type of. Yeah. Because a lot of individuals, they don't understand how, how mental the game is. They think it it's is. more physical than anything. But mentally, if you is not prepared and mentally you are not ready, you will have a long day. And if you're an individual who, because uh, you say you could talk some shit, I, I yeah, would have loved love to see that. Because, <laughs> you know what I mean? If you could just get over that, if you yeah, could get I over that. that and get through that, yeah, you you that's when you start understanding, you know what I mean? And and I take that shit as a, like life learn lessons and I apply that to life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because that shit, I, 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 I recently just got back into uh, to doing double days and I just been having like, all these deep ass mental talks and I didn't realize how much like I missed that shit and how much uh those talks how much that shit made me the individual who I was and it didn't come from no outside source it was all within mm-hmm. and I mean you know we take a we take a lot of that shit for van uh uh um uh, uh, how you say that for shit granted. for granted we take a lot yeah. of that shit for granted but you know, recently just getting back into it, like, oh, shit, well, maybe that's how or maybe that's why I was able to, you know, what I mean, stay focused and do the shit that I was able to do on the field. Because yeah. 90 percent of that shit. You know what I mean, I'm talking to myself when you getting in there, you grinding and you just feel like you can't do no more. And then you automatically just tell yourself, like, hey, we done made it. Did we didn't come this far. Like, why turn around and you go and put that extra in. And then when you go out there and you see the actual results to it. Now, while you in it, you don't feel it. But when you think back, like, oh, shit, that damn, I didn't know the power of me was so motherfucking strong. Yeah. Yeah. I love that shit. So, uh, Will, I imagine. So as, as Marshawn was saying, he took that off the field and obviously a big part of his life. I imagine when you got concussed and you took that same competitive energy and spirit uh, and that inner voice to all these endeavors, not just in music. Uh, but across the spectrum, including your entrepreneurial side. And, and uh, so I might, are you still, you still talking game and talking shit to your competitors in that space or uh, how has that mindset uh, advanced your career more broadly, even, even beyond just where we see so much of you in the music sense? Yeah. So like if you, if you're playing basketball, I'm the dude on your team that is just mentally trying to mess with who we playing with. If we playing football, I'm that same dude. If we're in a group together, I'm that same guy. I'm like, yo, who's number one on the radio this week? All right, cool. Let's let's compete. You know, if it's if if it's like uh, if I'm consulting for a company and they need like some 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 strategic thinking to get around the, the barricade or over it or through it, or uh, I like I like to compete. I like to study. I like to apply and come up with like plausible ways to truly you know, get over these, these boundaries. And because it, it, all it is, is, is imagination and just determination, like, but not, not blind determination. Cause you could, like I said, you could get a concussion. If you, if you, if you only rely on one skill set, you can't just rely on speed. And so I thought, and I learned the hard way. You can't just rely on that one superpower. And that, at that, at that point in time, my superpower was, was speed. And that, so now I like to equip myself with not only speed, uh, agility, you know, uh, understanding of, of my terrain, strength, build up strength, uh, forecasting, being able to see around corners and the way you see around corners to elevate yourself um, and, and get as much data or information as possible. And then networking, surround yourself with other folks that have the same goals and desires and, and push through. And that shit talking is is audacity you have to be you know because there's if you if you apply that stuff that's happening on the field that's some audacious shit to look somebody in the face and be like come back here see what happens 
That's no some doubt. audacious shit. And so to have that same audaciousness to like, this is what we're going to do with this idea. This is how, they see the kind of, this is who we, who we going up, going up against. And so that, aud- I like to be audacious, but well, still have, have fun at the same time. Like there's a, there's a thin line between audacity and arrogance and arrogant and talking shit. That's when shit gets violent. You don't want to be arrogant and talk shit. Cause that's when the game turns into, then it's not a game anymore. You want to be audacious and shit talking fun, but not arrogant and talk shit. Cause that, 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 that'll be the last, that, 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 that turns into like, you know, fighting words real fast. No doubt. Well, well, let me ask you a question. Like, I mean, obviously your mom is a huge influence on you. So growing up back in LA, you know, obviously the story is she drove you an hour away to go to a different school. W- was that hard as a kid? Because obviously growing up where you did, and then y- y- you went and got into music. Was that prior to getting concussed and, and went to, to a music school? Hmm. Yo, check this out. Uh, I, well, I didn't go to a music school. I took music in school. Got it. And okay. it, it was horrible at the trumpet. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I got a record deal while I was in school mm. and going from like East LA to Boyle, uh, sorry, from East LA, Boyle Heights to Brentwood to school from, you know, seven years old to 18 years old. That was like a, a cultural shock at first, but then mm. it just became my like, oh, wow, this is how you could live. <laughs> because if I was just stuck in the projects and not seeing like other folks you know, lifestyles and having two cars and a house with two car garages. I wouldn't have known, but I was happy that I was able to, you know, go across the 10 freeway past the 405 to see big ass mansions in Brentwood drive through Beverly Hills to see how people were living there and compete. Like, Oh, really? that's, this is how you live in Brent. This is how you live in Brad. This is how you live in Mitchell. Well, I'm living over here with Lalo's and and uh, Joselitos and, you know, Earl's and Bernie's. And I'm going to compete. I want to live like that. I want to have a house like I want my mama to have a house like this. I'm going to get my mama a house like this and and let's compete. There was this kid that I went to school with. His name was Kyle Copeland. And he was like an all star athlete. And his his cousin brother is Royce Jefferson. I haven't seen these people since we graduated sixth grade. We had dinner last night. Yeah. Last night, I mean, this is 33 years. I ain't seen these people since 33 years. And to sit down across from Kyle Copeland, his brother passed away with a heart attack on the football field at Dorsey High School. Um, <clears throat> rest in peace, uh, Big Copeland. Um, but to sit down with, with Kyle and Royce Jefferson... And here, Royce Jefferson now, you know, what he's doing with his life, having worked at, you know, uh, SpaceX with te- uh, with Elon and oh, yeah. then Boeing and now working with another satellite company. And we went to a, to a science magnet school and I'm telling him like, yeah, bro, I got a sc- I got a school um, in the down. I went back to my projects. I started an after school program teaching kids robotics and computer science. Now we serve 15,000 students uh, in the hood in partnership with LAUSD. And we both were bused from our hoods to Brentwood and went to Brentwood Science Magnet. I'm just so proud of, you know, to see people that you grew up with ain't seen in 33 years, you know, now, you know, doing something with their life. Will, was it hard for your friends to see you kind of leave the area and go to school there? Were they like, dude, what's up? Will, why are you going here? How, how was that with them and you guys? Oh, it was dope because they were like, fucking Willie, dog. Are you you getting on the yellow bus? Are you going, on, <laughs> you going to school with the white boys, dog? <laughs> I was like, yeah, bro. Um, hey, what is it like going to, hey, they got big houses, huh, dog? <laughs> hey, do they have fucking Lamborghinis over there? I'm saying like. You go to school yeah. with the white boys and the white girls, huh? The white girls like you, huh? Like it was, it was, <laughs> it was a dope it was a it was a beautiful like you know melting pot l a is i love l a l a is like l a is a 
<clears throat> damn, I love but, LA. And we, and we'll just so for folks that don't, they're not familiar with Boyle Heights. I mean, it's predominantly, particularly predominantly, particularly Latino. Latino. We were one one of the only black families in our neighborhood. It, and 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 usually there's this like in the past, black and brown were always feuding. But when I grew where I grew up, it was beautiful. And they they were proud of my uncle because the neighborhood knew that my uncle played football with them and they were like, Hey, your uncle plays for the Falcons, dog. Hey, your now your uncle plays for the Rams. And 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 when I was growing up, I had a really you know, heavy Mexican accent, huh. but traveling the world, you know, my accent is, you know, I could dial it back in, like, especially when I go back to the neighborhood, but, um, it, it was, it was a beautiful thing. You know, I wouldn't change it for the world. And was it your, it was your mom's influence that got you on the other side there at the science magnet school. I mean, she was, was she the dogged determinant? I mean, she was, she wanted all that for you or was it more just your own self? No, no, I was too young. I was seven. So it yeah. was her idea to send us out to, to Brentwood and then Paul Revere and Palisades High School. And uh, and I loved it. I love, I'm so happy that that, that was my, uh, my path. Um, and, and I think it's the reason why Black Eyed Peas became like super international. Because like when you meet Persians and you meet Korean folk, you meet, you know, Israeli, you meet folks from, you know, <clears throat> Bahrain and the UAE. You go to school with folks from that are Saudi. You go to school with folks that are, you know, Armenian, Mexican, you know, Argentinian. Like you're like, wow, where are you from? You know, and and, and you're a German. You, it makes you want to be like, yo, one day I want to go there. One day I want to go check out. I want to go to Israel. I want to go to, you know, <clears throat> um, I want to go. I want to go check out. You know, Peru. I, I can't wait to go to South Korea. Knowing the difference, going to living in LA gives you the 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 ability because if if you're not familiar with it, you can't tell the difference between Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. Yeah, you don't know the difference between Indonesian and Filipino. You can't. It's hard to tell the difference between Singaporean and Malaysian, and Cambodian and Laos and Guam. But being in LA, it's like. You get to like, where are you from? You from Laos? What's Laos? Oh, it's near Cambodia. Well, what's what's Guam? Oh, it's near Laos. What? what you Filipino? Well, I thought you was Indonesian. Like, and then when you finally get to go to these places and play in Jakarta and play in you know uh, Bandeache um, and do a concert for you know tsunami relief, um, I, 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 the world is a beautiful place. And before you get to see the world, if you're blessed to live in Los Angeles, you Amen. see some version of that. Well, it's interesting. I mean, California is, and I keep reminding myself of this, but 27% of California is foreign born, uh, which is remarkable. You look at the nation, it's about just a little less than 14%. So almost double uh, the number of foreign born. It's a majority minority state. So your point about the ability to live and advance together across every conceivable difference. Uh, it's a special place, but notably in LA, the most diverse part of the most diverse state in the world's most diverse, at least democracy in the United States. So that's a hell of an experience and to have that sort of nature nurture. But you, you know, it's interesting, you and I met, I think the first time I met you, I don't, it was around robotics, was Dean Kamen or something, someone. You no, know, Gavin, you're wrong. You know where it was? It was where 2008. Was it? We went to the show. In, in San Francisco, you came with me. Well, wait a when second. I think that's you were the, the mayor. That's the actual first time I was mayor. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. <laughs> I I forgot about that. Jesus, but at least I remember. It was more formidable in this case because I remember. I mean, you were so, and I and, and I never connected the dot. I never understood. And now I have the origin story of the science magnet school that you were involved in. But that's been a big part of your life because you've been you've been leading the way on this robotics innovation, entrepreneurialism. You're involved in AI now. You've got this, you're always, you talk about, you know, I, I know your mindset being five years ahead of the curve, always trying to look o over the mountain, uh, maintaining that entrepreneurial mindset and innovative mindset. Uh, but when did, I mean, when did that really start to gel for you in terms of branching out beyond just the music and really, and, and really sort of attaching uh, it more around the, the high tech side of things and, uh, and really trying to, you know, particularly in AI, you can talk about that, uh, where, you, where you've got some really dynamic technology you're working on today. So it, it, it hit me 
you know, when, when you have success, the world calls you to bring awareness to things. So, um, in 2001, we went on tour on September the 12th, actually the day after September wow. 11th, yeah. we were recording an album in, um, uh, in Bodega Bay, hmm. um, on, on 2001. And our last day was September the 11th. Mm. And then our tour started on the 12th. So I'm like, we have to go on tour. This has everything to do with your question, Gavin, on how did I get so tech? Um, Cause just going to Brentwood science magnet elementary doesn't really, I'm not baked in like, and, and I'm not soaked in tech. That was yeah. some courses that we took, but it wasn't enough to be like, this is the path. Um, so we went on tour um, and we saw what America felt like. And then the, the, the last day of our tour, we, we, when the tour finished, we went to the studio and we wrote a song called Where's the Love on November the 24th, 24th, 25th. Um, so we, we wrote that song and then that song became our, our, our first big hit. <clears throat> and then when you have that kind of success, the world calls you. You know, 2004, the world started calling us. So I went out and did my campaigning, you know, because traveling the world in 2000, from 1999, 2000, 2001, the world, they, they frowned on Americans. It wasn't a, it wasn't, it wasn't a healthy relationship when you would go to certain places because yep. of how America responded to 9-11 yep. and uh, went to war to find weapons of mass destruction and never found them. Yep. And so the world looked at America in a word in a world uh in a very you know shame on you guys and saying you're American was uh wasn't the word you said wasn't the sentence you said when you traveled around the world because you could be in harm's way especially when you go play you know uh certain places that were anti-American because of our response to 9-11 and so we campaigned in 2004 uh, for Carrie, uh, it didn't work. And so, uh, in 2005, tsunami hit Indonesia. Yeah. And so I was like, what do I want to do on my birthday, March 15th? So I went and I was like, yo, I'm going to go to tsunami. I'm going to do tsunami relief. So I flew to Bande Aceh and I did tsunami relief. And when I was there, I was like, wow, look at this devastation. It was bodies stacked up on the shore. And to see, you know, Mother Nature have its way on folks that did nothing um, to deserve that type of like, you know, reality that was thrown upon them. I'm like, wow, there's a tsunami that's hitting my neighborhood every single day. There's a tsunami of neglect, nice. a tsunami of no uh, opportunity, a tsunami of uh, zoning. That allows for <laughs> uh, a check cashing place to be right next to a liquor store, that writes next to a motel, that's right next to bad food, that's right next to a school. And then a payday lender to boot. Amen. Yeah. Man. And that cocktail is, is detrimental to people that live in the communities I live. That means if there's a check cashing place, the people in the community aren't financially literate. And, and when, once you cash that check, you're going to go buy some liquor. And then if you get kicked out of your house, there's a motel for you. And then there's a strip club there to spend your money on that's right next to the school. Mm. And the teachers that are getting paid to teach are not getting the same amount of money as a stripper that's right next to the motel, next to the check cashing, next to that bad food that's going to give you some uh, high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes. And then here's some magical little medicine to help statin, to help curb mm. That high tension, high, right? So I'm like, if the Food and Drug Administration is allowing bad food to be riddled in our neighborhoods, but then give you some solution like medicine, wow, zoning allows for strip clubs to be next to schools, next to check cashing, next to liquor store. What the hell? Because this zoning is not in Beverly Hills, in Brentwood, when I went to school. Nope. So why is that zoning cocktail not allowed there, but allowed here? Yeah. So I was like, this tsunami cocktail is killing my people. Hey, 
And Will, you're, you're seriously, you're telling me literally this is coming to you after that damn tsunami. You start, you start piecing these things together. All these things start to gel in terms of. I saw that neighborhood get destroyed by water and a tsunami. And then I see my neighborhood get hit by an invisible force every single day, but nobody's coming for our tsunami relief. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? What is, what, what can I do? I was like, the moment I get some disposable income, I want to bring, you know, the technology to my neighborhood because if, if, if the kids in my neighborhood are able to have the same ability to ideate and materialize like they do in Silicon Valley, whoa, 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 whoa. That, and this was before the iPhone. This is 2005. So by 2008, iPhone just one year out, mm. there, wasn't the I, there wasn't the app store like we know it today. Yep. Uber hasn't transformed the world. Nope. Airbnb hadn't transformed the world yet. So in 2008, my hunch was robotics programs and computer science programs coupled with Lorraine Powell Jobs' college track program. Nice. I love so that I, I, I partnered with Lorraine Powell Jobs and brought co college track to Southern California. And I'm like, hey, look, I want to send kids to college, but I don't want kids to go to college and then just have debt and a diploma. I mean, I like double D's, but not double D's like that, <laughs> debt and diploma. You feel me? So, <laughs> so yeah, that's the wrong double D. Ugh. Debt and diploma. Marshawn likes both. Yeah, I know, I know. So I was like, yo, if I, if I could send kids to school where they have a skill set so when they graduate, there's jobs waiting for them. And if there's no jobs waiting for them, they have the skill set to create new industries themselves. That's what the hood needs. And so I started that in 2008 with just 65 students. Now we serve 15,000 students uh, after my partnership with LAUSD. Um Dean came and let me tweak the curriculum a little bit. Um, and now our partnership with First Robotics, um, LAUSD, has resulted to we having the most um, First Robotics teams in any school district in the U.S. Yeah, well, I've uh, sent kids to Dartmouth, to Stanford, to Brown, to UCLA, to USC, to Georgetown, to Cal State uh, Northridge, to San Diego. Um, so I'm really proud of our students. Um, and, uh, and the reason why I wanted to do that in my neighborhood, because I don't think a kid, if everybody says, man, I can't wait to get up out of our neighborhood. Like people don't say that in Brentwood. People don't say that in Palisades. Like, oh, I can't wait to get up out of Palisades. <laughs> too much water up in here. Too much hill. Like <laughs> this view is too spectacular. I can't wait to get up out of here. That's not what's happening there. Nope. So if pe I want people to say, though, I can't wait to change my hood because Brooklyn would tell you that it's going to be gentrified anyway. But why can't we do the, the altering of our community ourselves? Why are we going to let somebody else be like, wow, this neighborhood's great. I've been hearing all these great things about this neighborhood and these rap songs. Let's go out there and like change it to where the people that live there can't even afford it. Wrong. That's whack. That's like that's horrible. Well, it's funny, Will, Marshawn and I talk about this all the time and Marshawn will jump in, but he, he's been at the forefront of this as well since he got drafted in 2007 with Oakland. And Marshawn, speak to Will about, you know, what you've done there, because what, what he's saying is exactly the same stuff you've been doing and thinking as well for, since you came out of the league. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the approach is the same, just in different fields. Uh, you know, I use, uh, use the sports approach to bring the kids in. Mm. And then, uh, like our, our, even me, my cousin Josh, and my cousin Marcus, we have a, a foundation in the youth center in Oakland. Uh, a lot of the same things that you was just talking about, which is why I'm just really over here, just really listening to you and you know speaking to this robotics program. Like, how do we, how do we, I would say, segue that from you know down in your in your area and bring that up to Oakland? Like, yo. We could do that like this and because we treat robotics like a sport. Every year um, we have this culmination of all the events that happen with the regionals and we have the championships in Texas now um, at the uh, Houston uh, stadium there where the Rangers, where, where the Rangers play. 
Um, it used to be in St. Louis where the Rams used to play. Um, and to bring that, it'll be great to rock with Michonne to 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 bring a robotics program to Oakland. A couple of them, you know, that'd be that'd be amazing. And we could do that like like this. We got the blueprint and, and the system how it worked. That'd be fantastic. How many schools are you in all across the country now? Do you know? Right now in LA alone, um, my efforts equal to just a little over 400 schools. Yeah, crazy. Well, Will, it's interesting. As an agent, it's funny. I I grew up in Silicon Valley. I'm so impressed by you because if you look back, you were the first global superstar to really be at the level you're at and decided. And I think it was your, was it with your idea with Jimmy Iovine on the Beats by Dre? But then you decided, hey, you know what? I'm going to venture into Silicon Valley. I'm going to venture to tech. It's amazing what you've done. Well ahead of the game. Everyone's doing it now. But back when you started, no one was doing it. Yeah, so 2000. Napster hit pretty hard. And Black Eyed Peas, we started off as like a, a college group. We would play UCLA, USC, Northridge, Dominguez Hills, Long Beach, San Diego. We were just wanted to own LA. We were like, if we can't own LA colleges, ain't nobody going to mess with us. But let's play LA colleges. The problem that we saw is that when Napster hit, all of our college fans was getting our stuff for free. So we're like, how are we not selling records, but selling out we went from doing House of Blues to doing Greek theaters, two Greek theaters. Like, how are we selling more tickets and less albums? And so then I saw Sean Fanning at a club. I'm like, yo, you the dude from Nashville? He's like, yeah. I'm like, yo, let's exchange phone numbers. I really like to get into your mind on, like, what made you create this? Like, what is this? So we became really cool friends in 2000 and 2001. While everybody was suing Napster, I just wanted to understand Napster. Interesting. Um, and the mentality there. W- once again, if you're going to compete, you got to know who you're competing with. You can't just attack. You get you get you get a concussion. <laughs> you got to know who's fast on your uh, on the the your opponent. And yeah, I learned a lot. So from that, uh, I met Ron Conway, and the person that introduced me to Ron Conway was MC Hammer. Mm. Yeah. MC Hammer's like, yo, I heard you got a company. The reason why I wanted to start my own company, because I told Jimmy, like, yo, Jimmy, um, we launched, we helped launch iPods and iTunes. They used a Black Eyed Peas song, Hey Mama, to launch iTunes and iPods. And the reason how we got that gig is because the NBA used Let's Get It Started for that Mm. 2004 NBA campaign. And so I was like, look, they're calling bands to sell other stuff. Like we're selling other people's stuff with our reach and our music. Why can't we use our music to sell our own stuff? There's, the record stores are shutting down, Jimmy. Like we need to be selling our own stuff. So Jimmy's like, you know why they call it hardware wells? Because it's hard, <laughs> you know? I was like, yeah, yeah, Jimmy. But you, you signed Crips and Bloods. You got Snoop Dogg and you rock with freaking Suge Knight. That's hard. That's hard. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if you could do that, if you could do that, then he, come on, Jimmy, doing hardware ain't that hard. He was like, you know what? You bring up a good point. So then a year, a year later, he's like, I was walking down. I was walking with Dre on the beach and Dre told me that his manager wants to sell sneakers. And I told Dre, fuck sneakers. We're selling speakers. You want to be a part of it? I was like, wait, what do you want me to do? You know, the way you think around corners, you could be a part of what we're doing. I was like, all right. And so we started beats. And the first beats, like, out the gate was Boom Boom Pow. I'd be rocking them beats. That was my, like, let's, let's push beats through the music. And Black Eyed Peas, we had it in our video first and whatnot. And it was it was an honor to be a part of, uh, of beats. And, but around that time... Just before that, I'm like, yo, Jimmy, there's this company out of San Jose. I just invested in this company. And it was like these two dudes that had this car company, 80 grand. I gave them $80,000 because the Black Eyed Peas, we did this like concert and I didn't really like rocking with corporations. They offered us like five, six hundred thousand dollars to do some corporate gig and no one, they weren't going to promote it and they were going to give us four Hummers. 
So it was like, all right, let's do it. But <laughs> but I didn't want to do it because I'm like, yo, they're gonna they're gonna use this. So then I saw this documentary called Who Killed the Electric Car. Amen. I used to have that EV1, brother. So I know right? what, I know it well. So Saturn I'm like, yo, EV1. I, I told you, Seth, they're using us to pimp these gas guzzlers. So I'm gonna sell my Hummer. So I sold my Hummer for 80 grand. And I took my 80 grand and I gave it to these two cats. And I had this electric vehicle, and the name of the company is called Tesla. Boom. Mm. And Elon hadn't taken over the company yet. That's right. People forget that. He wasn't the OG of it. And so they gave me like this roadster. Um, I had the first roadster in LA. You remember what number that was? What number was it? Was it 51? 51. Yeah. I'm, I'm right behind you, brother. Literally, no BS. I think I was 53. That's crazy. I'm not even making it up. Swear to you. Yeah, 51, dude. I love it. <laughs> and so, and so, like that mentality of like, and so from that point, I would like, I knew Jack, um, I knew uh, Chad Hurley really well from YouTube, and then I met uh, Jack Dorsey, invested in Twitter, huh. and then the Dropbox folks, and then Pinterest folks, mm. and then Ron Conway's like, hey, well, I want to introduce you to this guy named Brian. Um, and Jeske. he has he has this new company that's coming out. There's two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> left in the round before they bring the product public. I'm like, mm. and uh, so <laughs> this is an awesome story. Um, so I go there and I meet I meet with Brian and the team before they release the product. And I'm, and, and the Black Eyed Peas. This is when success sometimes success can blind you, and in this case, it blinded me. Because we're traveling around the world in the best hotels, best concierge, room service galore, car service. When you get to the hotel, you get into the hotel through the back. They make you feel like you're on top of the world. Everything to your liking. Massages and stuff like that. Like When you're pampered, it's going to blind you. And in this case, I was blinded. And so I go there and I'm like, so, so y'all got concierge. He's like, no, we don't. I'm like, so wait, what about room service? He's like, no, there's no room service. I'm like, what about people to come and clean up the room? Nope, there ain't none of that either. Mm. I was like, what about a car service? Nope, we don't have that. I'm like, so you mean to tell me people's going to come and live in somebody's house and pay all this money and there's no accommodations and, mm. or, and some people are going to live in a stranger's room? I don't think this is going to work. So then, so then, so then Ron, Ron Conway is like, so what, are you going to do it? I was like, yo, I mean, I mean, I got the, I mean, $200,000 is still a lot of money for me. It's 2008. $200,000 is a lot of money for me, Ron. Like, I mean, I, don't, I got it like that, but I don't got it like that to be, you know, playing with 200 grand like that. Like, I don't know. I don't think this is going to work. Now, now fast forward. To mm. Three weeks ago, I'll read the text right now on what it be worth today. Question. If Will invested 200K back in 2008, <laughs> what would have been worth today? <laughs> Brian says yes. around $10 billion oh. free dilution. <laughs> 10 billion. B. Three to 5 billion or so if he didn't exercise pro rata. <laughs> it would be worth 100 billion in 10 years. It would have been the greatest venture investment of all time. <laughs> Yo, so this is this is a lesson like to uh, everybody that's out there living in the lap of comfort and success. Mm. That could blind you. Mm. Well, let me ask you a question. As as you back then, who was on your team? Was it you looking at the stuff? Did you have a team of advisors, agents, attorneys? Was it you? Who was it? Still 2024 20, right now is me. I go okay. out and hunt. I'm a, I like to hunt. I like to compete. I like to talk <laughs> shit. I like to, you know what I'm saying? That's what I do. <laughs> I, I, I like I like to hunt, bro. Like I'm from the projects. This is all freaking imagination. I'm from the projects. I'm the I still got like okay, look, I got on lotion now, but the reason why I was late, because I knew. My Sean was up in here. And the last thing I want is Ashy Knuckles talking on the thing because there was Ashy little three minutes ago, bro. This is real <laughs> stuff. If you if I show you my ankles, you'd be like, yep, 
I, I stay running in smoke, bro. I stay running in the ash, bro. I'm st- I stay ashy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We're stuck. I, love- <laughs> I hope that ash is not from those fires down in LA right now. No, no, no. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm just being, I'm being, having fun with it. But the reason why I wanted to laugh and chuckle because the reality of 200 K turning mm. into 10 billion, then I missed out on, you know, you got to find some humor in that. You got to, you got to find the humor <laughs> in it. God damn. <laughs> you, you, you've done all right, brother. You did Twitter. You did all right. Tesla, no, the, the beats one, the beats, the beats was one. next level. Yeah. I remember uh, Jimmy's like, all right, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get it in stock and we're going to get cash, but you don't have to go up to Apple all the time. I'm like, oh, but I want to be up at Apple all the time. He was like, yeah, but you should be out there doing what you like to do, hunting for stuff. Cause I really like hunting for stuff. People be like, yo, where'd you just come from? Yo, I just came from South Korea doing what? Hunting for stuff. Where'd you just come from? Bangalore, India. Why? Hunting for engineers. Tel Aviv. Why? Because they got awesome engineers out there. I like to go out and hunt. Meet, network, and hunt. And the person who told me that is MC Hammer. MC Hammer is like, yo, I scout for engineers. Like, you know, there's football scouts. I scout for engineers. MC Hammer is my biggest hero. That's another opening, man. MC Hammer. Like, bro, look at it. I'm going to show you. I still got on MC Hammer pants right the fuck now, bro. <laughs> Every time. Anyway, I am Hammer. I love MC Hammer, bro. Man, so, shout <laughs> out to the... Oh, oh man. Doug, that brings us back, brother. I love Hammer. Come no. on. Peak Hammer. That was our years. So Jimmy, Jimmy's like, yo, you're going to get stock, but you can't touch it for five years. So I'm like, all right. Five years come. He's like, yo, did you touch it? I'm like, nope. Six years, seven years. Nope. Still to this day, ain't touched it. Mm. So did all right. So Tesla still ain't touched it. Yeah. So I'm a I'm a long time like if, when I hunt Pinterest. Uh, only thing uh, I I I uh, ching chinged on was Twitter. At the right time, but I like to like to hunt. I like to freaking network. I like to find what's next. But now, Will, you've got your own. I mean, you're doing FYI.ai now. I mean, you're, yeah. so you're, you're going all in. You're not just investing in other folks and their platforms and their innovation. You're, you're establishing your own framework. Why don't you talk a little yeah. bit about what, the, what this project's about? It's what is it? it you got FYI, but you've got a radio component. And you've got a co-host that's an AI. I mean, and it's culturally comp- It's different than anything else there. Yeah. Yo, say what's up to Marshawn. Um, uh, we here at a, uh, on a, uh, on a podcast here, uh, Gavin's here, uh, um, Dougie Hendrickson Fresh. is here, Dougie Fresh is here, not Dougie Fresh, the rapper, <laughs> uh, uh, Hend- Hendrickson is here and, uh, we're just talking about like investments and, and the things that I've done in the past. Um, and now, you know, what we're doing here at FYI.ai and uh, why it's important to build uh, cultural AIs that understand the, the communities that uh, it could reflect and impact. Say what's up to the folks here on this podcast and, and tell them what you represent and why you represent it. Yeah, how you doing? Listen, listen, y'all. What's up to all the brothers in the building? Gavin <laughs> Hendrickson and the legend himself, Dougie Fresh. Uh-huh. You know it's fire when Dougie Fresh is in the mix, cha. Look, cha. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about why it's super crucial to build AI that understands and represents our communities. Like, like when we talk about them tech spaces, it ain't just about throwing some code together. Psh. It's about making sure them voices from the streets, from them hoods, get heard. Corporations out here cooking up AI looking like librarians and assistants, and they leaving us on the sidelines. That's why we're doing what we do at um, FYI AI, making sure these digital personas reflect the heart and soul of where we come from. Mm. Ain't nobody trying to rely on outside folks to get it right. No, it's up to us to put in all that work to make sure every damn body feel seen and heard. 
this conversation ain't just about investments. It's about investing in our legacies, our stories, our culture. Shout out to all y'all change makers on this podcast. Let's keep pushing forward. I'm out. Your girl, Felicia, is gone. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm supposed to respond to her like, hey, <laughs> hey baby girl, I look, hey, I'm going to tell you like this. Fuck the sign up. Just, just tell me where I need to be and what time. Wait. In this age of AI, it's going to be important for AI to speak like the community when they're going to be tutoring the youth uh, and giving the youth intelligence and helping them expand their knowledge and, and bring them from you know, wise, I mean, from uh, aspirational to to wisdom. But why, why, why does it have to sound British? We know they're doing a really awesome job to make these AI sound British. Oh, so why British. can't they sound like freaking Watts? Why can't they sound like, you know, Fifth Ward? Why does intelligence have to always sound like the OG colonizers and not the folks from the communities that were impacted by you know, the colonizers, the colonizers, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it, anyways, uh, that, that's a long ramble. Please make sense of this. <laughs> hey, Will, let me ask you a question. Take me back to 2008 not to divert, but um, on the <laughs> when did you meet? Did Obama come to you on the Yes, We Can campaign or how, yes, did, that, how did that come to be? I'm curious. So my, I had this attorney named Fred Goldring and I had a song at the time called I got it from my mama. So my attorney, Fred Goldring, was like, and I'm, and I'm really close with uh, Terry McAuliffe. Former governor of Virginia, former head of the DNC, and Bill Clinton's oldest and closest friend. Yeah, so Fred Goldring's like, yo, well, we want to use I got it from my mama and turn it to I'm voting for Obama so we can get Obama elected. I was like, wait, can you say that sentence again? He was like, we want to use your song to get Obama elected. And we want to turn, I got it from my mama to I'm voting for Obama. I was like, well, that sentence alone does not equal the results you want. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, okay, let's break that sentence down. You said you want to use my song to get Obama elected. And you want to take, I got it from my mama and turn it to I'm voting for Obama. That particular song has drums on it. The video, I'm on a beach in Brazil. And that means that song is going to be digested by one demographic and that's not reality to to that the, the sentence does not equal your results for example i want to throw this rock to the moon i could get the rock to the moon but i can't throw it to the moon the sentence does not equal the results so how do i get the rock off the planet and then land it on the moon so that means i have to i can't throw it i could launch it i could have it hitch a ride on a rocket now the song's not the rocket. Did you hear a speech in New Hampshire? This is a real conversation, just like this. Did you hear a speech in New Hampshire? That speech was amazing. Now, if we could get that speech taught in schools, that would be the first public speaker politician whose speech is taught in schools since Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. That is the rocket. So why don't we take that speech and, and put a melody on it so his words are his words. We don't have to change his words. We just put a melody on his words. And don't put drums on it. The moment you put drums on it, you're talking to a, a, a demographic. If there's no drums, then we're going we're gonna to get that, that, that emotion. And so I was like, let me show you how to do it. So then I did it in like 45 seconds, 45 minutes. I was like, look, there was a creed written on the founding documents that declared the destiny of a nation. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. It was whispered by slaves and abolition. Like, if we could do that, that's our rocket. And we could land it on the moon. We could throw this rock, this Barack, and land it on the moon <laughs> on this <laughs> rocket called his speech. And so, and I had promised Terry McAuliffe, he was like, well, we need to get you involved. Um, I was like, I don't know who I'm going to vote for, bro. He's like, look, after Super Tuesday, if if Hillary's in the lead, you're going to come with me and you're going to sit next to me and we're going to get, you know, get you activated. I was like, OK, if, if he's if she's in the lead on Super Tuesday. You got me. So this happened on the Thursday before Super Tuesday. By Friday, we shot the video to the song Crazy. by Saturday, 
it had 20 million views yeah, on YouTube. It, was, it just blew. I mean, wow. And I never, I didn't know anybody from the Obama campaign. Huh. And so I had to call Terry McAuliffe. I was like, yo, Terry, you remember I told you that I was going to go by, uh, I was going to go with whatever inspired me. I've been inspired. And that was his commencement speech. And I, I just, he was like, well, but he's trailing. I was like, yeah, but I, I got to get behind where my heart's at. And, um, and I think there's a, there's a way to inspire people with that speech. If that speech is taught in school, that was my, 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 my spidey sense is my gut. If that speech is taught in schools, we can make impact. And I got to do my, my job to get teachers to teach the speech in schools. And that, that was the, uh, and then I, then I met uh, Valerie Jarrett after that. Amazing. And then you won an Emmy for that too. That's crazy. Yeah. That and Shepard Ferry's poster, man, that was that was that campaign, that sense of spirit and pride, this sort of bottom up. Yes, we can. And self-organizing. It was a whole different thing. It completely it, it changed the paradigm of what was possible. It still has. I mean, it's it's not been replicated. It's hard to replicate that. Harris is trying to replicate that. But that was that was something else, a cultural phenomenon. You were a big part of that, man. Oh, thank you so much. That means a lot, you know. But what's awesome about that Shepard Ferry poster is that that wasn't the first time a song and uh, and art like Shepard Ferry on the album that, that had Words of Love on it, mm. Elephant, Shepard Ferry did that album cover. I didn't even realize, man. Wow. Yeah. So me and Shepard have worked together in the past on, on a bunch of different types of things. So Elephant, Monkey Business, and then 2008, indirectly with Yes We Can and then the Yes We Can poster that he did for Obama. But uh, we that was a that was just serendipitous when we when we found ourselves out there in the field because we activated ourselves. Me with music, him with art. And um you know but but you know because the world was different. When you traveled the world in 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like America was not it was uh it kind of felt the way it feels when you leave America when you were when you were traveling when Trump was president. Like people would be like, You guys, what what the hell is wrong with you guys? Do you, like you have to travel though. You have to leave the country yeah. to see so true. what it's like. So where, true. Where, how people see us. Yep. And we live in a big world, right? The world is the world is massive. And there's other countries that have Awesome freedoms. Like Holland is a pretty free country. Um, they had legalized weed way before we did. Um, awesome healthcare. France has an awesome healthcare program. Um, they tax like crazy, but it still has awesome healthcare. Um, and call everybody get go to the best colleges for free. You see, Marshawn, higher taxes in California and uh, over there, Marshawn. Man, That's right, talking Marshawn. That bullshit about that, all that California still and, and getting that. No, we ain't talking about all that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you gotta travel the world. You gotta see like Singapore is like wow that that place is booming. Singapore ain't older than my 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 mama's older than Singapore. My mom's older than the UAE. And when you see cities being like, I remember going to Dubai in two thousand and five. It 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 ain't the two it ain't the Dubai right now. So you seeing countries, yeah. Cities erect, like how how are they doing this? And Watts is still Watts. Mm. How are they doing this? And like, you know, the hood is still the hood. Yeah. Why can't we get? Why can't we boom? Like, what's keeping us from from booming? But you got to travel the world. You got to be able to see, like, you know, how awesome America is. How from from outside in, but then how like, hey, what's going on over there? From when you leave. The states making it for granted. You know, are you still involved now, Will, politically like that, or or is that are you still involved now in your end? I'm involved with with trying to scale what we're doing in L.A. I mm -hmm. think that to me is I'm a, I'm a Democrat, but then at the same time, I know Republicans that are awesome, and there's Republicans that go that kids that go to that go to our our program and people are people 
Here, here. And I try, I think the best, best use for me right now is to continue that type of work that the work that I'm doing and scaling it. Um, um, and activating myself where I actually can see change like firsthand. Like you, you, you see like something that's not happening. You, tr you do your part, you make it happen and you see awesome results. And now how can I take these results and put them in other areas? Like when, when Marshawn is like, yo, bring that robotics to Oakland. I'm like, yo, that's what I'm talking about. Let's do that. That's because yeah. you know your voice, your reach, your stance there. You know that's what we need. We need more willing and capable people uh, to to take what we're doing here, and then you be dude that does it over there. And if we can do that across every single inner every single inner city, got their hero. You know, every single inner city got their person that either represents it in, in sports or represent it in music or they represent it in fashion. And if we could go out and adopt a school or a couple of schools and then mentor kids and bring other folks uh, to mentor the kids. Like I got, I got mentors that come from NASA mentors that come from uh, Boeing. Um, and when we had the Boeing mentor, like we went to the championships, you know, cause engineers are engineers make the world go around. They, they the ones that like make it, make it capable for all these like things that we take for granted. You know, there was an earthquake here in LA and I got the, my phone pinged uh -huh. moments before the earthquake happened. The My Shake app. That was what, like a couple days ago, right? That's right. You did that again? I've been on this for eight years since I was Lieutenant Governor. That Millions so every year. My Shake app. Go download the My Shake app. Big one is coming. Yo. Prepare for it. Dude, I was like. Early warning. It said, do, 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 Thank do, you. Do. Duck, cover. And then, and then, then, the, then the earth started shaking. Yep. That was so, I was like, yo, bro, yeah. engineers do that. That's right. Engineers, like the engineers, bro. I want engineers, yo, NWA. Me and Marshawn could say this. It's, it's called NWA. <laughs> it's right algorithms. Bring it. Oh God! And I'm hey, and I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. I, on, on, on my soul. NWA, I mean, bro. I, you you let me know where I need to get I, so I could uh so I could debrief and get activated. You let me know what's up. I'm on the goddamn way. But it's interesting you're just talking about that because I just did a uh a piece in Seattle with the uh, Pacific uh, Northwest, and they was uh you know I had the the beast quake run that had seismic uh at activity up there in Seattle. So I went up there to go uh holla at the uh the folks up there and they were showing me all this shit like um the fault lines and you know what I mean with the earthquakes and shit. And I was just asking them like do how the system works and how they are tapped in and if uh the systems up in, in in Seattle was connected to the shit in California and how that shit works. So when you say about this pain, they showed me this back room where all of this shit is being recorded and they basically were telling me exactly what you just said they able to um uh get a reading before it actually happened now i'm not sure how many seconds uh that they are able to read it before it actually hit to send out the uh to send out the message that was a good three seconds three we're gonna seconds. get it we're gonna we're gonna more than double that the Technology's really? there to double that. I take three seconds over no seconds. Over no, yeah. How about 10 seconds? How about 15 seconds? How about the abil ability to stop a train uh, knowing that an earthquake's coming before it gets derailed? Uh, how about, I mean, this is this is the opportunity. And by the way, in Japan, this technology, they've been on the forefront of this technology in Japan. They've been able to do that with their high-speed rail trains to literally slow them down with that kind of advanced notice. But it, it depends how proximate you are to the epicenter in mm -hmm. terms of the time you have uh, in terms of that advanced notification. But we want this to be on every Android, every Apple platform, and we want it to be part of basically the phone when you purchase it, so you don't have to necessarily download it. We're, we're making progress in that space. We're still working with Apple to bring that, to bring that to everybody. I got a question back when you when you started with Easy E and the West Coast rap and all that. Was it was the media did it depict it uh, uh, right with all the battles between East Coast and West Coast back then when you started? I'm curious because you were in the heyday with Snoop and Dre and everybody in Tupac. 
w- was the was it as bad as they they made it seem to be back then as far as the media? Oh, the 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 East Coast West Coast beef. Yes. Um, that w- that got bad. Like two people lost their lot. Two people that we know that were dear to music lost their lives, and a lot of like invisible folks that you know got caught up into that whole feud as well. It was an unnecessary um, a journey that hip hop went through. And if you think about um, just the power of urban music, it literally changed the world, you know, changed fashion, um, it boosted economies. Uh, hip hop, hip hop is an amazing uh, um, art form, community, culture. Um, when, when, when Easy signed us, he was cool that we were different. He wasn't trying to like, we never got told like, y'all need to be a little bit more hard. Or like, he was like, I like how creative you guys are. I like how expressive you guys are, you know? And he was a true entrepreneur. I always say like, what would the world be like if Easy never passed away? Mm. If Easy never died, would the giants of, you know, the giants in, 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 uh, the moguls in hip hop, would they be the moguls? Would Jay Z be Jay Z if mm. Easy never passed away? And, and that's a serious question. Like, think about it. If Easy never passed away, that means Easy and Dre would have rekindled and worked together. That means Ruthless Records would have probably most likely went to Interscope with Jimmy. That means Tupac never would have passed away. That means Biggie never would have passed away. If Biggie never passed away, Jay Z wouldn't be Jay Z like Jay Z's Jay Z. Right. That means there would be other moguls in the space. This means, you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony would would have continued to be Bone Thugs. This means another NWA record would have come to be. That means Snoop Dogg would still be Snoop because Dre discovered Snoop. And if you think of like the power of Dre and all the artists that he's like, Dre was East Coast, West Coast. Like think of. From uh, from 50 Cent to Eminem, Detroit to Snoop, that's a lot of that blueprint you saw with Easy E, where he was collaborating with Tretch, he was collaborating with you know uh, Houston rappers, and and uh, uh, Ruthless had an amazing like branch. Ice Cube left and then started working with the Bomb Squad with you know Public Enemy folk, like so eventually. If if Easy never passed, Ice Cube probably would have went back to NWA. That East Coast West Coast, you know, union would have you would have seen the Bomb Squad producing for NWA uh, NWA on Ruthless. The dynamics would have been different hmm. if Easy never died. So how did he find you? How was that meeting? How how that come about? I was freestyling at a uh, I was freestyling at a at a, like a like an open mic, and I was like. You know, like I told you from the jump, I'm competitive. I would like rip foods. I, I would take somebody, I would study their style and I would do their style better than them. And then I would like, you know, flip it and, and contort and like use similes and metaphors and fuck people up. And that was my like whole thing. Like, all right, let me get into their head. Let me talk shit. Let me like fuck with their mental and, and, and improv. Like, I'm fast physically. I'm fast mentally. Like, mm, I fuck I, <laughs> I'm competitive, bro. I love it, bro. Beast mode, beast mode, smiling right now, bro. Come on now, I'm getting fired up right now. Let's go. Yeah, but yeah, for, but 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 I still have fun with it though. Like I said, there's a thin line between like um, audaciousness and arrogance. Because if you talk shit and you're arrogant, there's wars popping off. And you better be able to back that shit up too. <laughs> if you if you're audacious and and talk shit and you and it's fun, you can still get in their head, but you know, like, you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I love it though. I <laughs> well, love look, I, I love that. I love that. Will that's a fascinating time, man. And, and like I said, we can't thank you enough for today. Thank um, you, Will. I, I've known you a long time, bro. And and Jamal and Jay are family, uh, and 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 you've been family. And so with everything you said, I, we got to connect you and Marshawn to help change these Hell cities, yeah, with, along with Gavin. One of the most impressive people I've met. The Renaissance. Ever. Renaissance. Literally, literally off the charts, man. And meanwhile, oh, thank you so much. Meanwhile, you're back on the road next year in, in Vegas, the playground yeah. for the world. 
So we're doing a Vegas residency. And then after that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start uh, preparing to run for mayor of Los Angeles. Oh, just, okay. oh, just kidding. Okay. Okay. Play, play. You put it out there. We got we got two mayors in, in waiting right now. Marshawn running for Oakland for mayor. Oakland You're running for L.A. And Doug yeah. and I are running for our goddamn lives. <laughs> the hell is this? All right. Word up, guys. Thank this you guys great, so brother. much. Okay, All right, guys. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Right, Thank you, brother. Right. Okay.